So we'll continue yesterday's discussion. So yesterday we looked at the advection equation. The advection equation is hyperbolic. It is du dt plus a big U times du dx equal to zero. The behavior of the advection equation is a wave going towards the left or going towards the right, right, depending on the sign of U. Okay, so we first uh, uh, derived how to discretize the advection equation and then we derived how to analyze the stability of the advection equation. So today we're going to continue from there. So the stability of the advection equation has a very important feature. The important feature is that the speed of this advection is going to decide what time step you can use for an explicit time integration scheme. And this condition, that is, a, uh, it, it applies for advection equation. It also applies for any hyperbolic equations. So this this condition is called the CFL condition. It's almost uh, simultaneously discovered by three people at the same time. So the naming of the condition then includes the uh, first the character of all these three people. So that's a C, F, and L. They, they are just the, the, the name of uh, three people who simultaneously discover this condition. Okay, so, so this condition is actually very important, not just in this particular equation, but in, for example, when we go to nonlinear equations, going to finite volume schemes, the same condition applies. It's called the, the CFL condition. And uh, also another uh, often referred word is uh, called uh, the CFL number. The CFL number is very closely related to the CFL condition. So if the CFL number is equal to 1, that means you are barely satisfying the CFL condition. If the number is 0.5, it means you are satisfying the CFL condition with a margin of 50%. Right? So this is a, um, this is a very important concept in almost any explicit or people also refer to CFL condition implicit schemes but for any hyperbolic equations this is a critical concept so why is it important let's first visualize it in a space-time grid now it's the first time we think of both space and time being discrete so this is x-axis this is time axis Previously, we know that we, we use finite difference to discretize the spatial domain, right? So we have grid points in x, so x0, x1, x2, all the way to xn. So these are my spatial grid points. Finite difference stores the value of my solution at these grid points. In discussing the CFL condition, we are also looking at a time discretization. So we initially we have T0 as our initial condition. So we are storing the value of our solution at each grid point at T0. And then my next time step, I go to T1. I store the solution here, right? We are looking at a, a two-dimensional function from up down, right? You can think of the height that the height of this map being the value of my solution. So my T2, etc. So here is where I store my solution. Now let's visualize what the linear advection equation do in this space-time plot. Linear advection equation, the behavior is that I have a solution. The solution keeps the same shape but moves towards the right if u is positive and move towards the left if u is negative, right? So in this space-time plot, what does the solution look like? It looks, yeah, diagonal line, yeah. It's, a, it's, it's almost like, think of the contour of the, of the solution. It's going to be di following diagonal like slanted lines. So, for example, if I have a wave, the peak of which is over here. So if I have a wave uh, or a Gaussian, the peak is over here. Then if U is positive, the peak is going to be moving towards the right, right? As T increases, the peak, the location of the peak is going to be shifted towards the right. If I have a valley, 
the location of the value is going to shift towards the right at the same speed. So if I have a contour of the space-time plot, every contour line is going to be slanted towards the right at the same angle. And the angle is determined by what? It's by u, right? So if u is 0, all these lines go straight up means the solution doesn't change. If u is positive, all the lines go towards the right. If u is negative, all the lines go towards the left. And the bigger the magnitude of u is, the shallower these lines are, right? OK, so yeah. The solutions uh, should go to the points, bro, or go between the points, too. Oh, we are, right now we are discussing the actual solution, not the numerical solution. Okay, now we, we are going to look at the numerical discretization. Okay, we're going to look at the numerical discretization. So, in finite difference, right, no matter if we are using a central difference or upwinded difference. So let's, for example, discuss if we use an upwinded difference. An upwinded difference, for this case, when u is greater than zero, spells like that. So d du dx is approximated at a grid point i it's approximated as a ui minus ui minus 1 divided by delta x because in this case the upwind direction is left or right it's left right because the wind comes from the left okay so that means we want to use a stencil a stencil is like where we uh, use the values right we want to use a stencil that shifts towards the left, which means I'm going to, instead of using ui and ui plus 1, I'm going to use ui minus 1 and ui. So this is the upwinded difference. And if I perform forward Euler, that means I'm going to approximate du dt as u at a time step of n plus 1 minus a time step of un divided by delta t. Combine them together, what I get is uh, u of n plus 1 at i minus u of n at i over delta t plus big U times u of i at n minus u of i minus 1 at n div uh, delta x is equal to 0. Okay. So this is my scheme. This is my space-time scheme. If I solve it on the computer, if I apply the scheme on the computer at every time step, what do you think? Which are the terms that are known? What are the terms are, that are unknown that I compute? What are the new values? What are the old values? We involve, let's say, th uh, three values in this scheme, right? So this is a va variable 1, this is variable 2, this is the same variable 2, this is the variable 3, right? So we have three different values. Which is new, which is old? The value at n plus 1 is new, right? So variable 1 is the new one, 2 and 3 are old. In this plot, for example, if this is the ith grid point and this is the nth time step, we are computing the value at this space-time grid point using the values here and here, right? So this is an update formula that computes this solid point using these uh, open uh, circles. The CFL condition says that you have to use uh, you have to use a small enough time step so that the slope when I connect these diagonal grid points has to be shallower than the slope of the red lines, which is the speed at which the real solution affects. Okay, so that's the CFL condition. Why does it make sense? It makes sense because let's go back to our initial discussion of domain of dependence. The red lines are not just the contours of the solution. It is actually characterizes the domain of influence and domain of dependence of the solution. If you change anything at this red point over here, the influence is, is going to be uh, affected along the red line on which 
the red dot is. In the opposite sense, the solution over here is influenced by any perturbation you can make along the red line before this particular point. So this is the domain of uh, dependence, right? The value here depends on any thing you do on the solution on the on the equation over this part of the space-time domain so this is the we call the analytical domain of dependence so that's if you solve it analytically that's where the solution depends there is also a numerical corresponding domain of dependence that is in our numerical solution of the PD where would the value here at i and uh, n well here is n plus one here is n so where would the value of n n plus one and i depend we're gonna see it doesn't depend on the solution at a single line right it actually depends on the value here depends on this open circle and this open circle because of this scheme Right. If you if you change uh, a different scheme, the domain of dependence is going to be slightly different. For example, if you use a central difference, this point would be included in the domain of dependence in the numerical domain of dependence. Okay. But this is not just it, because these open circles then depend on this point, right? Because here depends on this point. This also depends on this point. This also depends on this point and depends on this point, right? So when I go back for two time steps, I have three points that this closed circle depend on. Now if I go back more, there will be four points. And go back more, there will be five points. So the numerical domain of dependence is a is a infinite triangle, right? Is a is the space between two rays, one just uh, cast vertically down, one cast in uh, in an angle. The CFL condition says that this numerical domain of dependence numerical domain of dependence must cover the real analytical some people call it physical domain of dependence okay so this is the CFL condition it makes sense because yes question can you explain again uh, when you made the triangle of dots 